I believe we can continue with uh, today's second speech. I would kindly invite Dr. Kendall, Dr. Kendall Tucker. We all know Dr. Kendall that she works with lactation and breastfeeding. We have already made a brief introduction about her, but I need to remind you that Dr. Kendall, she is a psychologist, psychologist of health. She is a collaborator at the Psychology and Trauma Division of uh, the American Trauma Association and former president of the Psychology Trauma uh, Department of the same society. Dr. Kendall Tuckett uh, focuses her area of uh, research in lactation, depression, trauma, and the health psychology. She has received various prizes, among others, and the president for 2017 of uh, her excellent service in the field of trauma psychology from the American Psychology Association and the Trauma Association. Uh, Dr. Kendall Tuckett uh, has uh, published uh, in two scientific uh, magazines. She has written more than 420 scientific articles and chapters in books, as well as 35 books herself. And some of the most recent ones uh, are the following. Depression in young mothers. The science of sleep, mother-child, which is the topic on which she will focus in the following minutes. Welcome, Dr. Kendall Tuckett. Great pleasure and honor for us to have you here. And you may take the floor. Well, thank you, everyone, and thanks for the nice introduction. I appreciate that. Um, today, we're going to talk about a little more uh, happy topic than we did yesterday, uh, which is uh, the, the topic of mother-infant sleep. Uh, and this has actually been kind of an ongoing study that we've been working on, and so I'm going to show you some of our new data. And <coughs> in fact, one of the articles is just coming out in September. Uh, but there's been some exciting developments uh, that have been happening in mother-infant sleep. Now let me ask you a question. Um, how common is sleeping with your baby in Greece? Is it is it common? <laughs> okay. And what do the you know what do your pediatric society say about it? They say it's okay. Okay, kind of like kind of like us. Okay. Mothers do it anyway, right? <laughs> yes, not no, no. But I, I was actually thinking more of the official statement and then what people actually do. Yes. Okay. So um, one of the first things that you know, when we talk about sleep, you know, one of the things that I think is difficult is oftentimes people try to put it down to a very simple message. You know, never sleep with your baby. It's not safe. Uh, and they don't understand that those messages, you know, people tend to ignore them uh, because the, the, just the way that people sleep is much more complex. I mean, babies will sleep probably in multiple surfaces during the day, you know, and you need to kind of educate parents about all of those. You know, the baby will maybe nap one place, they may sleep in a car seat, they may sleep, you know, uh, in a playpen, you know, so many, many different places. And also, too, it changes during the course of the night. You know, so simple messaging is not really very effective. You know, and yet, the rhetoric about this abounds. You know, it's like hospitals have these, you know, and public health departments have these very strict policies. Uh, and, you know, so, we, you know, again, we hear a lot of stuff about it, and yet parents go off and do their own thing. Okay, and so what I think is actually really something we have to avoid is giving simple answers, you know, these simple sort of pronouncements, because, again, like I said, they're not, they, in the end, are not very helpful. Okay, and always, this is the point that's so important, and I think, you know, we, we would all agree with this, you know, our goal is infant safety. You know, we want those babies safe. You know, we want, you know, sometimes I've had people say, well, you care more about the breastfeeding than you care about the baby's safety. And it's like, that's so ridiculous. Of course we care about the baby's safety. You know, so are there ways that parents can do this safely? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Okay, so 
when we think about how to talk to parents, you know, the things we have to think about is whatever advice we give, first of all, it has to be something parents can do. You know, if it's something that's just totally beyond their routine, they're not going to be likely to do it. So it has to be doable. Uh, you know, it's very important, I think we'd all agree with this, not to undermine breastfeeding. And so when you give parents advice that separates babies, you know, from moms during the night, you know that that is actually going to have an impact on breastfeeding. And it's also going to make it more difficult for her. You know, so breastfeeding may be the thing that she sacrifices. So we don't want to undermine breastfeeding, whatever advice we give. You know, and this is really important too. Whatever advice we give about mother-infant sleep, we want to make sure it doesn't undermine the mother's mental health. Because that is, you know, just so important. Um, you know, there was a uh, lactation consultant I met in, in uh, Rochester, New York. And she came and picked me up at the airport and she told me about a mother she had just seen that day. And she was so frustrated because her hospital does not allow her to talk about sleeping with a baby. It's just absolutely, you are not allowed to do it. And she said this mother had come, she was from Taiwan originally. She was a math professor. And so, she, you know, in order to keep herself up at night while she was breastfeeding, she was up in the middle of the night doing math problems to keep herself awake while she was breastfeeding. And she was just about to the point of nervous breakdown by doing that, you know, night after night after night of no sleep. I mean, you can't sustain that. And her mother wasn't going to come for a few more weeks, but she realized the situation, and so she changed her flight, came in, basically showed up, saw the situation, and said, put your baby in the bed. And that fixed it. And the nurse was, the nurse and lactation consultant was so frustrated because she said, you know, she knew that that would have been the solution too, but she was not allowed to say that. You know, so I think sometimes the advice sometimes people give about sleep really does undermine mother's mental health. And that's something that's also important for us to consider. Okay, so when we talk about sleep with infants, we know that certain things actually are safe. There are some parameters. So it's not everybody should sleep with their baby, although many people do. But we know that there are some things that actually tend to be safe, and we, we, we know that. Um, first of all, if the mother is breastfeeding, and we find actually exclusively breastfeeding actually does seem to make a difference. But if she's breastfeeding at, at all, it seems to make a difference. Now, Jim McKenna actually says, now he's a researcher who's kind of studied this a lot, he doesn't think a mom who is not breastfeeding should ever sleep with their babies. And then I talked to Helen Ball, who is his counterpart in the UK. And she actually has also done a lot of this research looking at how mothers and babies sleep. And I asked her about that. I said, what do you think about that? And she said, well, she thinks that if a mom has breastfed, they're still going to exhibit the same protective behavior. You know, so she's not as like kind of cut and dry if a mom has formally breastfed, but there has to be some breastfeeding in that background with that mom. Now the reason why that's important is because a breastfeeding mom sleeps with her baby differently than a mom who is not breastfeeding. You know, and they've got the videotape evidence to show that. And you probably, all, you know, you all know what I'm talking about. When you have got a breastfeeding mom, how do you sleep? You, you're kind of like you're on the side like this, right? Baby, baby's here. You know, baby tends to be either face up or kind of like, you know, on the side. Baby's not face down. You know, and so there's this kind of nest that the breastfeeding mom makes. But what they found when they videotaped formula feeding moms, there's not that biological hormonal connection. And so the moms sometimes will flip their backs to the babies and dur uh, during their sleep. In one video, it was really kind of scary. The baby was kind of up between the two parents and wedged up between the pillows. You know, because there wasn't that, you know, sort of automatic in instinct to sort of make this little nest. So that's actually one of the reasons why they say, you know, if you're going to do this, you have to be breastfeeding. Uh, also very, very important that the mother not smoke. The SIDS rates go way up if a mother smokes. Um, also, any substances that impair responsiveness. You know, and this could be anything. This could be prescription medication, pain medication. Uh, we were actually, during the break, we were talking about a mom who was on an antidepressant that made her sleep very soundly. Uh, and so those would be babies I think we, we would not want right in the bed with the mother. Okay, so we don't want any you know, mom, anything that's going to impair her ability to be responsive. 
You know, and it's interesting because like some of the SIDS cases, the sudden infant death syndrome cases that we've had in the US, you know, when you really look at them, you know, f many of them are not meeting any of these parameters. You know, oftentimes the mothers are not breastfeeding, they're formula feeding, and substance abuse is in there in many, many cases. You know, when I was uh, uh, giving a talk in Omaha, Nebraska, you know, so they had this big sort of obstetric and pediatric, uh, you know, and all the, they made all the residents come to this conference, which was unusual at a breastfeeding conference. And one of the things I didn't know when I got there is they were doing something, they had a campaign at their hospital that every time a mom went home from the hospital, she was giving a refrigerator magnet in the shape of a coffin. And it said, don't sleep with your baby. And, and of course, I kind of said, I wish I'd known that before I sort of walked in there and started talking about sleep. But they had had, a, a, in six months, they had had seven infant deaths. And they ended up actually putting me next to the, the woman who was the architect of that plan at dinner. And again, I wish they'd kind of told me that's what they were going to do. Um, but it was interesting listening to her because I, you know, she told me about the cases. And she said, you know, I think I'm going to have to rethink this. Because six out of the seven cases, the mom was using a substance. Okay, and one was a grandmother who'd fallen asleep, like on the couch. You know, so none of them were these mothers. You know, a non-impaired, non-smoking, breastfeeding mother. And so, you know, like, I'll give you an example. Uh, one was a teenage mother who was on uh, crystal meth. And she came home, you know, from be being high and crawled into the baby's playpen. Okay, now, does that fit this definition? You know, another one is the mom and the dad had gone out drinking, mom passed out on the couch, and so when the baby woke up, dad brings mom, the baby, Ma mom is still unconscious, puts the baby on top of her, you know, and leaves. Again, you know, obviously mom was quite impaired, she was, you know, she was really drunk. Uh, so, horrible, tragic situations, but not this. You know, and so see, oftentimes the policies are made on those kind of cases, and we try to apply them to the breastfeeding non-smoking mother, and it doesn't make any sense. Okay, obviously now we, you know, a lot of research on baby on the back, on a non-fluffy and safe surface. Um, <coughs> you know, like one of the questions we have is we have these, you know, memory foam mattresses, you know, that are really sm squishy, and you know, that's the type of thing you need to kind of be able to talk to parents about. And you know, what kind of mattress do they have? And do they need to, to change that? But anything that you can put your hand in and leave a dent in, you probably don't want a baby on because it could be too soft. Okay, so how can you fix that? Very simple, easy fix. You take a yoga mat and you slide it under your sheet. Okay, problem solved. You've got a nice, you know, firm surface for that baby to sleep on. You know, so again, like I said, being able to kind of talk to parents about what they have and kind of being able to work with them in terms of the, you know, you know type of furniture they have. You know, in, in the U.S., uh, some hospitals have actually started giving out these cardboard boxes for babies. You know, they're kind of, they've got high sides and they're, they're very firm. You know, it's like even if you lay your arm on it and stuff, you're not going to be able to, like, smush the baby. And people have asked me what I think about those. I actually don't think that's a bad idea, truthfully. Because especially if you've got a mom who is a smoker, you know, who may not be breastfeeding, but you want the baby close by, you know, that gives the baby a separate space, but the baby's right there. Because, you know, if you think about it, you know, we recommend that the baby be in the same room, but not in the bed. But think about like a mom who's had like a C-section or even like a, you know, like a, you know, forceps delivery or something. That movement of reaching over in the middle of the night and grabbing that baby like this. You know, that's just going to be very, very painful for her. You know, I saw a videotape one time and it was on this huge, huge screen. And... You know, it was like kind of overwhelming to see this because this mother picked up the baby like this by the, by the onesie, you know, by the little thing he's wearing, picked up the baby like this and transferred him in the bed by his shirt. And the baby was going like this. And seeing this on a huge screen, I was kind of like... <laughs> and so I said something to somebody. She was one of the other speakers. And it turned out, actually, I'd forgotten it was her video. Oops, sorry. <laughs> But she said, um, she says, oh, I thought that was kind of natural, like a cat. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> so again, thinking about, you know, how can we make this easier for the moms? Because, you know, let's face it, it is hard to cope with the new baby. And so it's like everything we can do to make it easier is going gonna, is gonna to help prolong breastfeeding. Okay, now something else very important. 
the mom's body between the baby and anyone else in that bed. Okay, many of the SIDS deaths occur like with siblings in the bed, you know, so we want the mom's body to be a barrier. Okay, so if there's anybody else in that bed, mom's body is going to be the, the barrier. <coughs> okay, so what have we found recently? Okay, so um, I, but what a, this is our survey that we keep telling you about because we've actually gotten quite a few papers out of this. Um, my, I want to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Jen Kong from Texas Tech uh, University down in Lubbock and uh, Tom Hale, who I know you know. Okay, so just to tell you a little bit about more about our demographics. As I mentioned yesterday, um, you, just to be, in the, to be in the study, you had to have a baby zero to 12 months. That was the only restriction we had. So we had 6,410 moms participate. Um, we actually recruited this sample. This was, uh, we actually recruited this sample pre-Facebook. So actually what I did is I printed up 5,000 business cards and every place I went, I passed out these cards and said, have your moms be in our study. And then we got all kinds of, we got many from other countries that we never recruited in. So we were actually really tickled with that. Um, as I mentioned, the average age of the mothers was 31, but you can see the age range is pretty impressive. So 13 to 50. Now I remember when, the, when I first read that we had a couple of moms who were 50, and remember they have a baby zero to 12 months old. And I felt like I needed to go lay down for a little while because I was quite tired after I read that. It's like, <laughs> Okay, now a couple things that were kind of unusual about our sample is 93% of them were married and that was actually, that's pretty unusual. And again, like I said, we recruited, you know, really broadly and so, you know, it's interesting sometimes the things that pop up and 97% were living with a partner. Um, this was a very highly educated sample. You know, f so from the education standpoint, we would call the middle class. When we looked at income, at least in the U.S. sample of this, it was a pretty broad spectrum. Um, this was a, a nine, seventy-nine percent of them indicated that they were exclusively breastfeeding. Um, Eighteen percent did a combination, so that was about sixteen hundred mothers, I think. And then we had about four hundred moms who were exclusively formula feeding. And again, we're not considering this representative of the, the population. I think this is representative of, of who we sampled our, our data from. Okay, so let's take a look at bed sharing and breastfeeding, and what do we know about this from previous studies? Um, well, this is uh, an, an interesting study from Helen Ball, who I mentioned. She's one of the big sleep researchers in the UK. And she followed babies, 97 babies, for a year. And she found that any amount of bed sharing increased breastfeeding. You know, so bed sharing, what she concluded, was something that was really helping to sustain breastfeeding. That without that, mothers were more likely to stop. Okay, uh, you know, and she found, in fact, the bed sharing families were twice as likely to continue breastfeeding compared to the non bed sharing families. So, again, it's something very important for us to consider because when we're talking about infant survival, breastfeeding is a key part of that. And so, you know, the advice that we give, and you'll see the SIDS researchers are starting to say this now too, the advice we give has to not compromise breastfeeding. You know, and so oftentimes when you say don't bed share, don't bed share, you may be giving advice that is compromising breastfeeding. And that's got to be sort of the balance. You know, again, kind of how can we have a conversation about this and encourage parents to do safe things? Uh, you know, in Jim McKenna's uh, ethnographic study, so it basically went and, you know, sort of just talked to people, did a qualitative study. Um, you know, many of these uh, mothers who initially had bought a crib, planned to have the baby in a separate place, found actually that they ended up naturally bed sharing just because they were, you know, feeding so frequently at night. And so even mothers who hadn't intended to were bed sharing. Okay, and um, this was an interesting study. Uh, uh, this is Blair, Peter Blair. He's a SIDS researcher. And so, again, he's one of the SIDS researchers who I think is kind of understanding the importance of um, what we know about uh, bed sharing and breastfeeding. And this is looking from this big longitudinal study that uh, people keep using in the, in the UK. And he basically found uh, that all bed sharing patterns actually increased breastfeeding. So, you know, when I, when I talk about bed sharing patterns, it's kind of like, okay, does the baby sleep with the parents all of the night? Does the baby start the night in the bed? Does the baby end the night in the bed? Um, so there's different kind of patterns and configurations that people do. So again, I said it kind of shows you the complexity of this. But it didn't matter which one, all of them by 12 months increased breastfeeding. 
Okay, and this is what he said. Remember, he's a SIDS researcher. Advice on whether bed sharing should be discouraged needs to take into account the important relationship with breastfeeding. And so again, I think that this is a really kind of important quote because it's coming from the other side. Because so for, for so long we had, you know, sort of the breastfeeding advocates over here and the SIDS researchers over here, and there was just no middle ground. You know, and, and Peter Blair has kind of started venturing a little bit into the middle ground, you know, and we appreciate him for that. Okay, now this was an interesting study also too, in showing that uh, uh, longer bed sharing was related to any patterns of breastfeeding. Again, sort of a longitudinal study. Uh, so, um, you know, looking at uh, babies up to 12 months. So again, we see the same pattern. It's just over and over and over again. Okay, and now this is actually in our data. We found this as well. Um, that uh, bed sharing, you were much more likely to be exclusively breastfeeding if you were bed sharing. Okay, so very clearly. And again, I said, I think it's real consistent with the other, with the other literature. Now, what's interesting is this study from Germany. Uh, and this researcher's named Veneman. And Veneman is the one who wrote the meta-analysis that was used to craft the American Academy of Pediatrics statement. Okay, so again, he's, on this, he's kind of on the, the SIDS researcher side. But he actually found that breastfeeding reduced SIDS by 50%. You know, so again, I think that what's happening is the SIDS researchers are recognizing the importance of breastfeeding. And we know that bed sharing prolongs breastfeeding. So it's kind of like, what kind of advice can we give parents that can help them sort of meet that breastfeeding goal, but also keep the baby safe? Okay, and this was interesting too, because he's, this is what, what, what Veneman said. He said, we recommend including the advice to breastfeed through six months of age in sudden infant death syndrome risk reduction messages. You know, so again, you know, giving sort of a SIDS researcher coming out and acknowledging the importance of breastfeeding. That's kind of huge. Okay, so a couple of other things to consider. You know, tired parents have to feed their babies someplace at night. You know, and what to me was actually really frightening was seeing what parents were actually starting to do. Because we had hammered on that no bed sharing, no bed sharing ever, ever, ever for so long. What I found parents were starting to do, what parents were telling me, is they were going out and sitting on the couch in the middle of the night to breastfeed. And that was scaring me to death because that is something that we know is actually quite dangerous. And so what we were doing was taking something we thought was dangerous and telling parents not to do it and actually encouraging a far more dangerous behavior. That's actually one of the reasons why we did the survey because I was hearing that from parents. And I remember talking to our public health department and, and, and they were saying, no, I don't think parents are doing that. Okay, so, you know, we look at a picture like this, right? We can probably all relate to this. Yet, how dangerous is this, you know, in terms of actually, you know, falling asleep, you know, with a baby like that in a, on a couch? It's so, that it, it increases the SIDS rates just exponentially. So what we want to do with our messaging is avoid unintended consequences, and this is one. You know, falling breastfeeding rates and falling asleep in dangerous places. You know, um, this is actually from Melissa Bartek and Linda Smith. I thought this was actually rather interesting. They wrote this in Breastfeeding Medicine. They said, advice to never bed share relies on parents to suppress an overwhelming biological imperative. It is thus unrealistic and unfeasible. You know, so again, I think that that's just kind of an important, uh, an important message to recognize is that parents will naturally want to do this. Okay, so I think another important question is to really get a, a real sense of how parents actually sleep. And one thing I kind of discovered is that parents tend to actually not tell you the truth about this, or they hedge. And we actually find our white middle class mothers are very good at that. You know, and I found that when I was doing the, the extended breastfeeding study back in the, in the 90s. You know, I would meet mothers who I had known for a long time, and they would say, oh, what are you working on now? And I said, oh, you know, we're working on these papers on, on extended breastfeeding. And they said, oh, that's really interesting. And then they'd turn around and they'd say, what do you mean by extended? <laughs> and then I found out there's this whole network of underground sort of mothers that were, you know, sort of under the radar, not telling their doctors, not doing everything. So I knew sleep was going to be very, very similar. So I was actually careful kind of how I asked about it. 
You know, but I think that this is important because we need to recognize what families are actually doing. Okay, and this is actually what uh, Laura said in 2007. It's important to understand the characteristic of bed sharers in order to inform public policy and health education content and to guide the clinical practice and help focus future research. And I think that that's the piece that's often missing in this sort of public health uh, approach. Okay, so when you look at these data, now what's interesting about these data is these data were actually, the paper was published in 2007, but the data were actually collected in 1998. And the reason that date's important is that was before our Consumer Product Safety Administration came out with a very strong never bed share message. That was kind of the beginning of that campaign. And so we felt like parents were probably being a little more truthful. And what's interesting is take a look at this. 77% of the mothers said that they bed share some of the time. And only 23% said that they never bed share. Okay, so that's, you know, what? Three quarters of the moms are telling you that they're bed sharing at least part of the time. You know, so even with the messaging and stuff, this is still going on. Now, what's also interesting is, you know, people have the idea that the, the people who never bed share are engaging in safer behavior. And it isn't actually true, because prone sleep, which we know is actually, you know, highly related to SIDS, is much more likely to occur in the never bed sharing group versus the ones who always bed share. Okay, so putting your baby face down on their stomach. Now, I thought this one was very interesting. This was done in 2013, and I really think this is an example of a study where they were not getting the truth from mothers. Because remember, you just saw that LAR data. 77% said they bed share at least some of the time. Now, in this sample, you know, they did it kind of longitudinally over a period of like, you know, uh, years. And so, you know, in the original sample in 93, only 6% said that they, they um, bed share. And that actually went up to 13% in 2009. Now, 13%, don't you think some of those mothers might not be telling the truth? And yet they were alarmed. They said, well, there's many mothers that are not listening to the current guidelines. And I thought, there's many more than you probably realize, because this is a way underestimate of what's going on. Yeah, and they said here, the current American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation about bed sharing is not universally followed. Yeah, you think? Now, what's also interesting is they looked at the demographic factors. You know, so they looked at, you know, um, the things that were kind of related to it. And so it tended to actually be, you know, this was in some ways kind of the stereotype, but they, you know, it's amazing actually how many studies have not included the demographic factors. Uh, they said mostly, you know, black and Hispanic, and that's actually in our, in our country very common in those cultures, but lower income, uh, living in the South and the West, babies less than eight weeks, that's a little bit concerning, and having a preterm baby, also a little bit concerning. Okay, so when we asked parents the reasons for their sleep arrangements, I thought that was very interesting because that really kind of came down to really a couple things. Either it was a philosophical belief or an ide ideological belief. Okay, in this case, it's the right way to do it. This is how you parent a child. And we found actually some pretty interesting ethnic differences here. Because again, many times, especially with our African American population, people say, oh, it's part of the culture. People believe it's the right thing to do. And yet we didn't really find that. You know, we found about 50% of our moms uh, in this sample actually said that. But the only thing that worked, you know, more of the pragmatic approach, you know, and I've had, I've had moms say, you know, like one of my friends from church, actually she was from the Philippines, and she was sleeping with her baby. And her neighbors, who also went to our church, were giving her a hard time about that. You know, and I was about ready to kind of go and give her some social support, and she didn't need it. Because she said, you know what, if they want to come over, she says, i got to go to work in the morning. And she said, if they want to come over and walk the baby, that's fine. But for right now, this is what's working for us. And that is actually often the, the, the reason why people do this. And you'd find, too, only 4% of the moms actually indicated that, the, um, that it was because of what the doctor said. They really actually aren't listening to healthcare providers on this. You know, it comes down to two, you know, those two things. You know, either they think it's the right thing to do or it's the only thing that worked. Only 4% did it because the doctor told them. And it was actually kind of interesting that it was much more likely to be the Asians. You know, and in some ways that's almost kind of like a stereotype, but it actually was a pretty striking difference. Okay, so we also looked at the mother's demographics, which I thought were actually, these turned out to be kind of interesting. Uh, they were much more likely to be bed sharing if they were either single or separated. You know, and uh, you could see, like especially separated, it was probably a stressful time for the families. 
you know, so I can actually see where everybody would probably end up sleeping together. Uh, what was also interesting is the mothers, we looked at age at first birth and, and their current age. And you found actually that the, um, the current age was the same across the, th you know, the three things. The baby sleeps in the crib in a different room, in the bedroom, uh, or they bed share. But the younger mothers, the mothers who were younger at their first birth were much more likely to bed share. I said, yeah, some of these data were kind of surprising. And I actually thought it would be higher with the employed mothers. But actually, it wasn't. The bed sharing rate was actually higher among the mothers who were not currently employed. And we also found a big difference by income. So it is actually, this is actually true. The lower income families often are the ones who are more likely to bed share. And we found a similar kind of pattern with regard to education level. Okay, the more educated you were. And again, like I said, I think in some ways it's because, you know, higher income and more educated families, you know, have more resources. And so, because this is a pretty hard routine to follow, and so they have more resources to be able to kind of do it. And we actually found that they were the ones more likely to go out and sleep on the couch, too. Okay, now this is actually some of our current work. Um, this is a paper that's coming out in September is one of the questions people ask me is, you know, you know, I showed you yesterday the sleep data and looked at exclusive breastfeeding, you know, and how it impacted sleep. And they said, does where the baby sleep make a difference in that? And it actually does uh, in a lot of the cases. Okay, so, you know, first of all, what's kind of interesting is, remember I, I showed you yesterday that the mothers actually sleep the longest, you know, if they're exclusively breastfeeding. And what's kind of interesting about that is, the babies are still waking up a lot more. Okay, so, and the babies are sleeping, the, the formula feeding, or excuse me, the exclusive breastfeeding, bed sharing, the babies are sleeping the shortest amount at the longest stretch of sleep. Okay, and you know, again, sometimes people will use this as an argument and say, well, see, this is why the mother should exclusively formula feed, because the baby sleeps a longer time. You know, but again, going back to that sort of SIDS argument, you know, one of the theories of SIDS is that babies go into such a deep sleep that they can't get out of it. They, they don't rouse from it, they just keep going. You know, and so having long stretches of sleep isn't necessarily a safe thing. You know, and you see it really does make a difference and it also makes a difference with where the baby is. Okay, um, they're also more likely to wake in the middle of the night if they're bed sharing. And I thought this was actually kind of interesting. Um, this is looking at non-exclusively breastfeeding mothers. So this is our mixed and formula feeding moms. If you're bed sharing, it takes a longer time for your baby to settle down. You know, if you're not exclusively breastfeeding. And you know, some people have kind of said, I had somebody, a graduate student who was doing a thesis on this, and she wanted to say that, you know, mothers who bed shared were more depressed and more anxious. And I said, you know, I don't think the literature actually supports that. And she says, well, that's what I've seen in my clinical practice. You know, and we haven't, we hadn't had any research on that until, until actually we did this study. You know, I think actually what she's probably seen might be the bed sharing non-exclusively breastfeeding mothers. Because we do see more problems with that, you know. And so it kind of goes back to that same argument about who should be bed sharing. You know, and I think we could make a pretty compelling argument that it, it's probably a better experience for everybody if the mom is exclusively breastfeeding and bed sharing versus not exclusively breastfeeding and bed sharing. You know, putting the safety issue aside for a minute, let's look at how it is from the mom and the baby's experience. Okay, now you do see that the babies wake up, if they're exclusively breastfeeding and bed sharing, they wake up the most amount of time. You know, so again, it's really kind of interesting to think about, okay, well, yeah, but how in, how in the world is the mother actually getting more sleep? Baby sleeping a shorter stretch, waking up more. And yet we see that the exclusively breastfeeding bed sharing mother gets more sleep. Okay, because remember you saw exclusively breastfeeding mothers just kind of across the board got more sleep. But it does make a difference in terms of, you know, we got this interaction effect. And so it does make a difference uh, in terms of, <coughs> you know, where the baby is sleeping. And, and so, again, you can kind of see why people sort of like go to this and start doing this. Uh, and also, remember I told you about minutes to fall asleep is kind of an important uh, thing that we look at in terms of postpartum depression. So there was basically a main effect of exclusive breastfeeding up here. Okay, so exclusive breastfeeding does make a difference, you know, you, whether, wherever the baby sleeps. Um, but, you know, when you look at non-exclusive breastfeeding, 
you know, it's taking the moms a lot longer. Because again, they're not probably getting as much of that sort of hormonal support that helps them go to sleep. I think that that's one of the reasons why the exclusively breastfeeding mothers get more sleep, is because they go to sleep faster. Is what? Is this for the mother's sleep or Okay, this is actually for the mother's sleep. Yes, this is mother's sleep. So remember how many minutes it takes her to get to sleep. You know, and sometimes I've had moms say, well, you're, you, what about, you know, the moms who have no idea how long it takes them to get to sleep, right? Those are not the moms we're worried about, are they? <laughs> right? Because <laughs> they're getting into bed and they're going, <laughs> But the moms that we are worried about are the ones who can tell you exactly how minutes, many minutes. Why? Because they're sitting there looking at the clock and they can't get to sleep. Uh, we have this sort of very angry book. Um, it's called, uh, well, I'm not going to actually give you the actual title, but it's called Go the F Asleep. Um, and so it's an angry children's book and it's kind of a joke. Actually, Samuel L. Jackson apparently reads it out loud on, on uh, YouTube. But I think actually it's kind of that frustration. You know, the, the, the parents want the baby to go to sleep and the baby won't go to sleep. You know, and especially if you're, the baby's sitting right next to you and you're getting kind of frustrated because this baby is not going to sleep. You know, so again, like I said, I think it's an argument for, you know, separate sleep space might be better in this case. It's just next to the mom. Okay, so we also find that that also uh, works in terms of her daily energy. She has less daily energy if she is bed sharing and not exclusively breastfeeding. But the moms who got, had the most energy were the ones who were bed sharing and br exclusively breastfeeding. Oh, slower, okay. Okay, and the overall physical health, it was also reflected in this. Okay, so how healthy the mom reported herself to be. And again, you see a main effect of exclusive breastfeeding. Okay, so exclusive breastfeeding, no matter where the baby sleeps, you feel like you have better health than if you're not exclusively breastfeeding. But what's interesting is, again, look at this. It's the lowest here for the ones who are not exclusively breastfeeding but bed sharing. You know, so I, I think this is really kind of arguing this is really not a great idea for the moms who are not exclusively breastfeeding. Um, it also, a sort of course, impacted mother's mental health. Uh, take a look at this one. Remember that I told you about that children's book. Look at, her, look at the mom's anger and irritability. And again, remember, it's taking the baby longer to settle. So you can kind of see how the mom would be frustrated. And yet here, you know, the mom is actually not very angry. I mean, you know, no more than sort of usual. And exclusive breastfeeding does make a difference on that in both. But I just think this is really striking. Uh, and also, these are the moms that tend to have more anxiety and more depressive symptoms. Okay, so in here you see like kind of main effects of non-exclusive breastfeeding. So see, you can see this is another sort of argument about how breastfeeding does protect maternal mental health. And especially exclusive breastfeeding seems to actually really make a big difference. Okay, and you see that that's, you know, again, another main effect. So a main effect, no matter where the baby sleeps, lower, lower depressive rates. So how are we doing on time here? Ah, we're great. So what can we conclude from this? I think the first thing we can conclude is this is complicated, isn't it? You know, there's so many factors that, that come into this. You know, where the baby sleeps, um, you know, how the baby sleeps, their ethnicity, their income, their education. And so there's just the one simple message just doesn't work. And what we really have found is that parents kind of ignore that. Okay, and also too, I think we need to kind of respect what the parents are doing. You know, that they, they do things often for logical th reasons. And actually, um, one slide I didn't show you in here, but when we asked parents, you know, first of all, where does your baby usually sleep? About 30% said they were bed sharing. So then I said, where does your baby end the night? That's the question. And it ran between 60 and 65% <laughs> for the first year. Okay, so you know, 60 to 65% are bed sharing at least part of the time. And a pattern you often see, especially after six months, is that the babies go in the crib, and they have, maybe even in the other room, okay, for the first part of the night, and then the baby wakes up, and they bring the baby into bed. Okay, so again, like I said, you know, these parents are often going to their healthcare providers and saying, oh yes, the baby sleeps in a crib. 
But that's really not the whole answer, is it? It's kind of like, what is your parent doing, the, or what is that baby doing the rest of the night? And so if we can't talk to parents about that, you know, we need to kind of, um, you know, they, they often can do things that are pretty unsafe. Now, one of the things we found is that parents, families who were bed sharing were also more likely to have siblings in the bed. And again, that's just something to be concerned about when you've got a baby in the bed. So remember, mom's body has got to be the barrier. Nobody sleeps next to that baby but mom because siblings next to the, to the, to the baby actually can be dangerous. Okay, so that's something to kind of, we need to kind of think about. Um, the other thing that we found is the bed sharing families were also more likely, about 50% of them also reported having their pets in the bed. You know, and it's like, I mean, I, my house looks like a zoo. I have a lot of animals. You know, I get it, okay? You like your animals. But is that safe with a baby? I, I don't think so. Now, and especially, I had somebody say, well, what about those dogs who can detect sleep apnea? <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> okay, the sleep apnea dogs can stay. Everybody else has got to go, you know? So. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, they may not be telling you what they're actually doing, you know, and so if we come at them sometimes with these hard kind of line things, we're never going to actually hear this. And then I think we miss opportunities to educate them. You know, and even something as simple as just using that, you know, a yoga mat to make a firm surface on a bed, you know, some, some, some simple fixes. Now what's kind of interesting is, remember I told you about smoking is actually a big increase in uh, SIDS risk. You know, it goes up by like 10 times if the mother smokes, a mother or, or anybody else in the bed. Um, the Maori in New Zealand, they all bed share and they all smoke, you know, and they were having pretty high SIDS rates. And so what they started doing is they started kind of having people weave these sort of traditional baskets. They have these beautiful designs they do and they have these baskets, you know, kind of like what we call a Moses basket. Um, and they were putting those baskets in the bed and it dropped their SIDS rates in half. You know, so again, kind of thinking about what kind of solutions can we come up with that are sort of creative. That's one of the reasons I kind of like those baby boxes. You know, for the moms who are not exclusively breastfeeding, I think that's a great, that's a great kind of compromise. If they don't want to have the baby in a situation where you have to pick up and grab in the middle of the night. Okay, and I think when we message about safe sleep, we need to acknowledge these realities. You know, because especially what we find in a lot of our, like, ethnic minority communities, they just tune out. They hear this and they think, oh, there's a bunch of white people coming to tell me what to do. Forget about it, you know. And so they don't, they don't listen. And so again, like I said, part of this has to be with how we, you know, how we respect families and what they're doing. Um, okay, and I think that is the end. Oh, and I, this is the book that she mentioned, The, the Science of Mother and Infant Sleep. Actually, I know Nikos has got a copy of that. Uh, and so uh, we do have a couple of uh, time, minutes for questions, I think. Three minutes for questions? Yeah, you can go on. Oh. Um, Erotesis? We actually have a fair amount of resources up on the various, my various websites, especially if you go to Breastfeeding Made Simple, um, but also on my Kathleen Kendall Tackett site, I've got all of our articles that we've we published on the sleep study, if you want to take a look at them, you know, so they're all kind of available for free up there. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, uh, I'm trying to think if there's one other thing. You know, uh, there was actually a quote in here, I actually have it in one of my other sleep talks, and it's kind of a nice... Uh, statement. It was actually originally from the Mothering Magazine, and it was uh, a quote from a child protective service worker. Okay, so he goes in when there's cases of frank abuse and neglect, you know, and he, you know, works with these families who are actually, you know, in the system as being abusive. And he said that, you know, the one thing you want to try to do is you want to work with the family to sort of mitigate harm, you know, but if you come up with a routine or something that's completely outside of their their range, they're not going to do it, they're just going to ignore you. You know, and he said, it, he thought it was kind of the same with sleep. You know, we have all these programs where we buy cribs and bring them into families. And what you often find is, you know, like when home visitors go in, they find that the cribs are full of toys and diapers, and the baby's still in the bed. You know, and he said asking the family to completely redo their whole routine, you know, he says is not very realistic, and it's more likely, it's advice more likely to be ignored. So, again, like I said, I, I really kind of hope we all can start having more uh, rational conversations and be able to actually talk to parents, because I think if we actually talk to parents, we can kind of educate them about how to keep the baby safe, but definitely not out sleeping on the couch. Um, what they've kind of found when they've looked at the SIDS rates with that 
is it increases the SIDS rates by 67 times. Okay, that's why I was actually so terrified when mothers started telling me what they were doing. And what we found, it was mostly the, the middle class mothers and the more educated you were, the higher your income. You know, so the lowest risk group normally in terms of infant death, we've turned them into a very high risk group. 44% of them has acknowledged that they had fallen asleep in an unsafe location. You know, so it, it is a problem. The American Academy of Pediatrics statement actually did change to acknowledge that, I think actually based on our study. So we were happy about that. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? I, I, I would like to thank you, first of all, for, the, for your talk. And uh, uh, If you have any questions, just for two or three minutes. Excellent speech. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh. OK. Uh, Professor um, Kendall, what is your opinion about the creeps that come next to the bed at the same level and come the one side down? And now they try some hospitals, uh, baby friendly ones, to have the yeah. creeps in the hospital also. Um, well, the, the, the sidecar cribs. I think are probably kind of a nice solution. I, I will tell you my friend Wendy Middlemiss, who you know, co-edited the book with me, she's a little more concerned about them because she thinks babies sometimes can slip between the cracks. So as long as that is, is safe you know, and it's, like it's really firm in there, I think they're actually probably a good compromise. What we find is sometimes those are kind of expensive for moms. You know, so it, in, for, it, it, it works for some moms, but not for everybody. Uh, Having the sidecar on the hospital beds, I think, is a brilliant idea. I think we absolutely have. I, I, I wish we would do that. I, I've seen the ones that actually are in Helen Ball studies, and they're so nice having those, you know, the baby right there. And the mother's more responsive at night when the babies are in those little sidecars versus the bassinet. So, yeah, I think they're absolutely brilliant. I think they're safer, too, because I think actually trying to, especially in a hospital bed, trying to lift a baby out. You know, and, and you're in a high hospital bed and trying to lift a baby out in the middle of the night. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I think sometimes moms actually drop those babies. You know, so that's actually scary. So, yeah, I think those sidecar things on hospital beds are brilliant. Yes, Ada. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, what would you suggest to parents that smoke, or uh, either of them? Because it's a cultural thing and we do have quite a few smoking fathers, mm. where would the, the child sleep? Well, I think I would follow kind of, in that case, the example of like the Maori, you know, about having the baby in a separate surface. So maybe like, again, one of those baby baskets or something in the bed, you know, it, it dropped that SIDS rate in half in New Zealand. So the problem, is it their exhaling of uh, the carbon dioxide or is it their movement? You know. Nobody actually knows exactly why smoking is such a problem. They don't know if it's because if a mom smoked, you know, if she's smoking after the baby's born, she probably smoked during pregnancy. They don't know if it's the smoke on her clothes or in the house. You know, so they're not sure what it is, but we just know that having a smoking parent does increase SIDS. So I think, you know, something like that kind of what they did with the Maori, I think is a kind of a good example, you know, of what to do. Yeah, because it's tricky. You, when you have a, a lot of people who smoke. I think if I remember well that uh, it is the, because the, the baby is uh, um, accustomed to a hypoxemic uh, environment in a way because it's more carbon dioxide and, the, and it, it lives in that environment. So the threshold of uh, having the, passed the borderline for seeds is more possible in a hypoxemic environment. I think, I think that's one of the... <laughs> Because, because they, they don't change the side to, to be covered for even a small time of, uh, yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. you know, like one of the things we kind of recommend to is like if a mom does smoke, that she, you know, sort of wash and take off whatever she was wearing when she smokes. You know, some obviously smoke outside. I mean, we, it's probably some of it is the smoke on the clothes and in the hair. You know, but yeah, it does seem to, I think mother smoking is probably worse, but I think having a smoking parent, they've, they've kind of shown that that is kind of a danger. So again, you know, I think one of those baskets is a kind of a good compromise. It, it, I think it's protect, it protects the baby. The third hand smoking. And the what? Third hand smoking. Not the second hand smoke. Oh, second, third, second hand smoke, yeah. Not second, third hand smoke. Third hand smoke, yes. Kalimera, kalosirzate. Good morning, welcome. I wish to ask you whether you believe is it correct for a father to take uh, 
the newborn in another room for the mother to be able to rest. But then we hear the baby all crying and the mother cannot sleep. Is it a good solution or not? Um, I, I people recommend that all the time for depression. And it's exactly what you said. The mother is the first person who wakes up and that hears that baby. You know, and so and the father's like laying there, you know. <laughs> Peter Hartman showed me a cartoon about, you know, the way that the father handles, you know, the, the baby waking up and he actually is picking up the mother and taking him to the baby. <laughs> I know, it was, like, it was great. Um, but I, I, sometimes you work with a mom who is so tired that she's just going to drop. You know, we've all had that, right? When a, the mother's hanging on by a thread. And so in those situations, I think it's okay for the mom to go have a nap. You know, if she can get four hours of sleep in a row, I think you're gonna find she's gonna feel a lot better. So I would use that as a temporary solution. Um, some people in the perinatal depression world think that that should be the way it always is, the mom gets sleep. But I think the problem is the mom hears the, the baby waking up and the mom's listening for the baby. So she's not necessarily getting sleep. I think it has to be somebody who the mom really trusts with that baby too, because I think otherwise you're not gonna go to sleep. But sometimes if she can maybe have just a brief, like breastfeed the baby and then go lay down, take a, you know, get some sleep, get four hours, I think she's gonna feel a lot better. And so I, I, I kind of view that more as almost an emergency solution than something I would recommend all the time. But sometimes you just have to do it because you get these moms who are so, so tired that they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're almost sick, they're so tired. Yeah. But the child should be after the 12 months. We're not dealing with an infant. Let's say in the case we're dealing with a child of more than 12 months. What should we do in this case? So, you know, there's a couple things. Um, is the child sleeping with the parents? Yes, but the mother is tired. And then we have the father who takes the child in another room for the mother to be able to sleep. And then he start, the child, which is 12 months, he starts screaming all of a sudden. What should we do? <laughs> okay, um, that one's probably a little more complicated. Uh, what you could do is there might be a way to gradually wean the child from the parent's bed. So maybe you start with having the, you know, a, you know, a crib mattress on the floor in the parent's bedroom. You know, and it kind of gradually gets a little more separated. You know, but, you know, if the child is upset, you go get them. You don't let them to scream. Uh, and, but, you know, maybe so, do something a little more gradual. So the mom, because what a lot of moms, especially with toddlers, feel, they feel like the baby's on all the time. Like just nurse, nurse, nurse. And, and sometimes they just, they, they, it's too much. So having a more gradual sort of weaning out of the bed can work well with a lot of those, a lot of those babies. You know, so again, having like baby, like a separate sleep space and the thing. And then with older toddlers, you can say, you can come get in the bed with us when it's light outside or when the clock says this, you know, and starting to kind of set some realistic. So the mom has a little bit of space, you know, but still you're meeting the needs of the child. Uh, uh. Uh, regarding smoke, uh, if a mother contacts us and uh, asks uh, information about smoking right. or how many cigarettes a day or something uh, similar, do you think it's uh, necessary to give her information about uh, safe sleep too? If a mom is smoking? No, if she asks for information yeah. uh, regarding smoking and asks us, uh, can I smoke uh, while I'm breastfeeding or uh, could I when I give birth uh, and something like that. Do you think it's necessary to give her information about safe sleep so oh. that she knows that if she smokes, the dangers are uh, more? Yeah, I would say yes, definitely give her, give, give her information. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe, you know, t discuss some of the solutions about, okay, separate convenient space, but mm -hmm. separate space, okay. you know, because I think that's important if she's smoking, okay. All right. you know, but also make it doable for her to continue mm -hmm. to breastfeed, because I think actually the limit right now is like two packs, mm -hmm. she can smoke two packs a day, mm -hmm. and it's still, it's still better for the baby than mm -hmm. getting formula. Yeah. 
Uh, but, but obviously, you know, the more she can cut down, I think the, mm -hmm. the, the better for everybody. But she should know about uh, the sleep arrangement. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I would say that. And, and again, like I said, you know, just, you know, the whole thing is because I, you know, I think for parents, the goal is to keep the baby safe too. Mm -hmm. You know, so say this is kind of what we know and this is so let's think about how we can make this so it's safe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Να δώσουμε ακόμα το λόγο για δύο ερωτήσει, okay. γιατί ο χρόνο έχει περάσει. Two more questions. Could I kindly ask you, uh, for how long can a child sleep with the children? Is there is there a limit for that age limit? I, I would say actually, uh, off the top of my head, no, because if you look at cultures around the world, you know many. Um, children sleep with their parents on and off for years. You know, I, I had friends who were from Latin America and even as like young adults, they'd come crawl and get into bed with their parents, you know, sometime in the middle of the night. Or, you know, like one of my friends was, you know, her toddler, they said they never knew which bed he was going to wake up in, you know, because he would wander in the middle of the night and he'd get in with his sister, or he'd get in with the mom and dad, or, you know, so, so I, I think it really kind of comes down to, you know, what is the, what is the parent's preference? And you know what is the child? Eventually, you know the children do. It's kind of like with with long-term breastfeeding. You know they eventually stop. You know, and so they don't necessarily do that. But you know, if, even like places like you know like Japan, you know, where everybody kind of sleeps together for years. You know, and it doesn't actually seem to create any harm. Uh, in fact, it seems to actually create some resilience. There's something about that that's really kind of special. So I think it's kind of up to the parents. But I think this whole strict, you know, they got to be, you know, down the, you know, down the hall in a separate room, and I mean, that is just really not consistent with kind of what we've done throughout sort of history. And again, like I said, looking at other cultures. Uh, so again, if, if parents, if the parents kind of feel like they need some space, you know, then I think it's okay to kind of have a little bit of separation there. But if everybody's happy with it. You know, I know whole families that kind of like they have a, like a you know configuration of beds on the floor, and that seems to actually work for them. You know, so I think that that you know I told you yesterday um, my kids were three and five, and we finally moved them out together and put them in their own room, and mainly because they just got too big. I mean, they were just like because they're big kids, you know, and so it's like you wake up and you got a leg over your head in the morning, you know, <laughs> so there's just not quite enough room. Um, but we moved them together so that they went, you know, they didn't go by themselves. You know, and we kind of did it, we did it sort of gradually. But no, I, you know, I don't really think there is an upper limit. I said, I even know, you know, some lady I was talking to who'd come from Japan, and she ended up actually staying with some people, and they had to share a bed. And she was actually saying how nice it was, because she missed that since she'd, you know, grown up with that. You know, and she hadn't actually really shared a bed, you know, with anybody sort of in a nice sort of family way in a long time. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's any upper limit on it. Νομίζω έχουμε το χρόνο για μια τελευταία ερώτηση, κυρία, στο τέλος με το άσπρο. Περιμένετε λίγο. Uh, according, as, uh, according to the sleep, uh, AAP sleep recommendations, the child uh, should be slept uncovered, without blanket, without anything. So what do we say to mothers with bed chair? Should the baby be above or under her blanket? Uh. Um, a lot of the concern about that is that the babies can suffocate. You know, we get all these fluffy blankets and, and so they kind of recommend, first of all, you don't want the baby overheating because that does seem to be one of the things that increases risk for SIDS. Uh, and you, you don't necessarily want a bunch of stuff that they could, they could get trapped in. And so that, that's based on the, the recommendation. You know, so you'd probably dress them lightly so they're comfortable, um, but not necessarily put a bunch of the stuff we normally, you know, a lot of times parents put in cribs that they could get tangled in. Uh, and especially uh, concerning are the things that are fluffy. Anything that's fluffy is, is really kind of not a, not a good idea with a newborn. So I would say, yes. you know, I, I think actually that recommendation is a, is a sound one. So maybe, maybe put babies in kind of like a, a, a jumper or a onesie, you know, like one of those little suits uh, where they can stay at a nice temperature, um, but not too hot. Yes, but when the baby sleeps between the parents, what, what about when the baby sleeps between mother and father? They can probably just be like in a, a, a onesie or something. And I would be careful about sleeping between mother and father. Because again, like I said, sometimes those babies kind of wander. You know, we, we want really that baby next to mom. 
Um, and so, you know, because dad doesn't necessarily have that hormonal connection with the baby. You know, so, so with a newborn, I would be careful about having them in between mom and dad. So only next to mom, not between mother and father? Uh, not until they're a little bit older. Okay, be and above the blanket, not, not under, above mother's blanket. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Νομίζω ότι δεν έχουμε τον χρόνο για άλλε ερωτήσει. Σα ευχαριστούμε θερμά για την προσοχή σα. Thank you, 